Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Glad you uh, could uh, to make it to the webinar. I appreciate you guys taking the time to, to listen, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, be able to communicate a few things that uh, make this uh, process uh, uh, simpler for you. Um, my, my vision here was to create um, some short snippets that would help managers um, get more familiar with the ISO process. And, and I had this big vision where, you know, I was going to get warehouse managers and you know, production managers and, you know, all those guys were going to be so interested that they were going to sign up for these webinars. But um, uh, I'm not sure how, you know, maybe I'm doing some wishful thinking here. But but the, 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 the issue here is the new standard is really focused on management engagement. And um, a lot of the organizations that, that um, I, I've uh, audited uh, struggle with, with, with managers' understanding of the ISO processes and um, uh, you know, their, their own ISO program. So that, that was kind of the vision here. Um, so today we're going to discuss uh, the, the first section of the, the new standard, the context of the organization. Um, and, and this is one of these uh, areas where I think the ISO people have invented some new words and, and, and want to create some confusion. And um, I'm hoping by the end of the webinar, we, we can demystify the the new words that they're using and, and, and help articulate what, if any, changes this could result in our, in our environmental system. So today, um, we've got a pretty good cross-section of people here, um, even though I, everybody hasn't shown up but uh, a good portion of you are. So I uh, appreciate everybody that's here. Um, about 50% of you guys are clients of mine, and I do appreciate your, your business. So either, either, either you're a current client or former customer, and that's always appreciated. Um, about 25% of you guys, I, I've been kind of probably bugging with uh, my newsletters for a number of years, and and, and you're kind of on the fringe of wanting to call me up and give me a, a purchase order. And then the other 25% of you are some new people might, might have contacted you through LinkedIn or some other uh, forum, but I'm glad to have you guys as well. So um, that's, that's who's there. Um, the new standard itself, again, I'm not going to you know, talk about the standard in its entirety, but I, I think the, the bottom line is if you recycled cardboard and disposed of oil um, before you upgraded your system, you're still going to recycle cardboard and dispose of used oil. Um, I think a lot of the changes in the standard are pushing uh, companies to, to better integrate the ISO requirements for environmental into their business processes. Um, and to connect some of the dots between uh, some of the things you're already doing, your quality systems. You know, your quality system already has a supplier management program. Uh, your engineering process already has a management of change um, type program. And trying to connect the, you know, the environmental dots to, to some of those things that we're already doing. Um, but but um, again, the whole standard is set up on the Plan Do Check Act uh, process. Uh, today we're going to talk about the first section here, the context of the organization and, and what that means relative to your environmental system. And um, hopefully, again, give you some, some pointers on, on what your external auditors are going to be looking for. Um, and, and again, my, my background is, is I, I do some, some registration auditing for a number of different registration companies. Um, and then I also do the, the consulting and training that, that you guys have uh, have uh, have called me about so that's that's kind of kind of my background and, and I'm really hoping to shed some light on I think what the external uh, registration companies are going to look for uh, relative to this specific element and the, the last thing I'll talk about is just the 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 new structure of the standard uh, the the ISO folks have come up with this new Annex SL format uh, for management system standards. Um, basically taking ISO 9001, 
ISO 14001 and soon to be ISO 45001 uh, relative to health and safety and putting them in a standard format. Um, so all, all three of these standards are going to have the same 10 sections. Um, obviously within each section, depending on the standard, there will be different information. Uh, but they're trying to streamline these things so that they can be integrated into a single uh, a business management process versus separate systems. And, and even today, um, I still see some organizations where you know they're very separate quality, environmental, and safety systems are very separate, um, and that really interferes with, with their efficiencies um, and, and, and overall management engagement. That's one of the key uh, changes in, in the new standard is uh, getting management uh, better engaged with, with the environmental program. So here is the words. We'll, we'll talk about the new words um, and hopefully shed some light on those things. And, and the, again, just try to give you an appreciation for uh, when your external auditor comes in um, how and what they might audit or look for audit evidence. Um, and, I and I think the registration uh, companies and auditors, they're all still figuring this stuff out. So the, the good news is even though your ISO auditor will come in and, and be projecting his expertise um, in a lot of these areas, um, they're still trying to figure out uh, how to interpret some of these, these issues as well. So the the... Section 4.0, context of the organization, is split up into, into uh, four subsections. First, understanding your context, understanding the needs and expectations of interested parties, determining your scope, and then developing your management system. Now, the changes that they've made to the standard, the entire intention of the changes are to expand the scope of your management system beyond your fence line. That's what the ISO people want. They want you looking over your fence line at things out there that you can control or influence. Uh, a lot of the decisions that you make inside your fence line have environmental impacts that occur outside the fence line. And, and that's really the, the entire purpose of the change. Um, and I say that just so that when you keep that in mind, that um, it, it takes some of the pressure off. And, you know. If, if, if all they want us to do is look outside of our fence line and, and look at what we, we uh, uh, can influence, um, that, that really is the intention of the changes to this, to this section. Um, and, it, and it wants us to define what constitutes our environmental system. There, there may be other things out there that we, we've excluded before um, that maybe we shouldn't have excluded. And, and again, uh, just trying to capture all of this uh, information inside the context of, of your environmental program. So it, just as a refresher course, um, here is the old uh, standard 4.1 general requirements. And, and effectively, that's what this new element has replaced. So under 4.1, it just said we shall establish and improve an environmental management system and we will document our scope and again for most organizations the scope ended at their fence line what activities do we do inside the fence line what activities impact the environment how do we control those things uh, now there's going to be a number of things that again are activities that we do within our operations but the actual impact of that operation uh, activity um, isn't on our site, but it's it's off site, and that's really where the 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 ISO um, changes are trying to drive us. So 4.1, we're going to understand our organization and our context, um, and that. You know, I, I can't think of the number of times before this standard came out that I've actually used the word context. Um, this is basically just saying we're, we, we will know who we are and where we're located, 
and what can influence us. So the, the organization, and that's you guys, uh, you'll determine the external and internal issues relevant to your purpose. So I guess that's the first question you have to ask. What is our purpose? Uh, that can affect our ability to achieve our intended outcomes of our environmental system. And so what they're asking us to do is take a look at issues internally, externally, depends where we're located, um, that can ultimately affect our ability to, to achieve our intended outcomes. And the, the ISO people have some minimum intended outcomes, and we'll talk about those in a second. So basically, they're looking for you guys to understand the external issues, you know, local government, local uh, environmental groups, the discharge of your stormwater. Does it go to a protected watershed or a, a shed with the restricted uh, uh, TMDL levels, and, and that might affect your your uh, your permitting? Internally, did, are we are we are we struggling to stay in business? Do, do we have enough uh, funding to uh, fund our improvement projects? Uh, those, those types of things. And if you look at the standard itself, th there is no specific documentation required. Uh, but they need to see evidence within your management system that you've you have uh, you have uh, taken into account these internal and external conditions. Um, so a lot of sites that I'm working with, I, I am taking a look at their, their manual. Um, we are putting in some, some verbiage, a, a short description of, of issues and context, uh, but it's not required. The standard does not require any, any, uh, any documentation for this element. So, you know, it'll be up to you guys. The, the, the first thing your, your ISO auditors will do when they come in is they'll talk to your management team and they'll ask them about the context of the organization and how it was considered when they developed the environmental system. And, and it's not going to be just one person, um, you know, the, the old environmental management rep. It's going to be a, a good cross-section of, of the management team. And I, I didn't say this to begin with, but um, because of the size of the group, I really can't open things up for, for questions and, and comments. Uh, but if you do have any comments or questions, uh, please use the text box to, to text those in. Uh, because frankly, your questions will, will benefit everybody on, on the call and it will help uh, you know, further uh, expand in the, the, the information that we're talking about. So again, what are the intended outcomes of our management system? Well, obviously, we would like to be in compliance. Uh, again, here's a pretty picture. This comes right out of the standard. The, the gray area, it's the stuff outside of our scope and internal to our scope that can affect our intended outcomes. So they, they, they want us to look at, you know, you know, here are some environmental issues. That affects everybody. Uh, air quality, are, is it a, are we in an ozone attainment versus non-attainment area? Um, how does that affect our, our, our context? Um, water quality issues, we, we, we talked about stormwater a second ago. Uh, land use, uh, are there, is there prior contamination of our site that could be affecting, um, affecting our adjacent uh, property owners? Uh, what are some of the economic and uh, technology issues, social, uh, competitive issues? Are you know again, uh, are, are we are we strapped for for capital, or do we have enough to 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 fund our capital projects? Uh, internal, maybe you have some corporate mandates that that come down to your facility. A sustainability program, the culture, the, the management culture of of the of your organization. Uh, these are all things that could potentially influence what they call your uh, intended outcomes. So the, the minimum intended outcomes that the ISO people have 
have uh, have talked about in the standard, at least in the the, the front end of it. Uh, so when asked about your intended outcomes, it's it's the enhancement of environmental performance. And element 9.0 talks a lot about performance assessing. There's a real big push on understanding and driving performance improvements. So the, the outcome of our program should be to enhance our environmental performance, uh, fulfill our compliance obligations, and achieve our environmental objectives. So again, if you can think of anything internally or externally that could influence those three, at least those three things, or other issues that you may consider to be an intended outcome of your program, those would be issues or parts of your context. Uh, again, when your registration company comes in, that's what they want to hear from you. They want to hear you talk about these internal and external issues, your newfound understanding of, of this context, and how you implemented things within your environmental system to, to, to deal with these issues. Um, now, I, I have watched some other webinars and gone through numbers of training and had a lot of discussions with other auditors. And it isn't just enough to demonstrate an awareness of your context, or do we need to have documented evidence that we've considered our context in our management system? That, that's the $14,000 question here. Um, but, but again, your, your external auditor is going to say, okay, this is an issue relative to your site. How did you incorporate that into your management system? And um, the uh, you know, school's out as to what kind of evidence that they, they want to see to demonstrate that. But hopefully I'll give you some examples here in a second that will um, shed some light on Another, uh, you know, intended outcome for some organizations would be um, programs. A lot of you, the bigger companies, have very well-defined sustainability measures and metrics. That's another, uh, again, intended outcome of, of your program that you should be talking to during your ISO audits. So, so here's where the, the rubber hits the road. I, I've tried to give you some examples, but these are just I'm just scratching the surface here. Uh, but just to give you an, a little example of some context and the issues and where you should see evidence in your program um, that these things have been taken into consideration. And you, you may work for a company that's got 100 facilities. Well, each facility has a different context or has different contextual issues. Um, and, and I just work with the company had um, you know 15 different locations and they, they wanted to have one scope description and and try to you know include all 15 sites without doing a specific scope description for each location and I told them good luck you know and their their external auditor brought up the concern as well so you, you, with each facility again even though you're part of the same organization um, will have different types of issues uh, that, that may affect its context. So, so here we've, we've got a site with high employee turnover, uh, which creates a, a lack of engagement with the environmental processes and awareness. And again, where you should see evidence of this consideration, it would be in your employee retention process, your HR program, um, some evidence that we are trying to retain our, our employees and trying to, to stop the turnover. Maybe we should all get, maybe we should give them all a raise. That's easy, right? Don't say that. Um, but, but again, just an example of, of an issue um, and, and where we should see it within the environmental program. Uh, another site's got an active rail line adjacent to their property. Okay, so the issue is we, we could have a derailed chemical tanker. Before, that would have been considered out of our scope. But now that we've 
open up our eyes past our fence line, we, we see the adjacent rail line. Uh, we see the fact that there could be a, a chemical tanker uh, derailment or release, and we go into our emergency and we put in what our response to that, that potential emergency would be. Uh, same situation, I was, I was at another location, right adjacent to them was a propane storage facility. And I said, well, in the, in the event of a propane release or a leak or explosion, how would you guys respond? Well, they did some arm waving, but when, I, when you look at their emergency action plan, it's not considered. Uh, let's see here. The company has restricted access to capital or a very short payback criteria. The issue is that it impacts their ability to implement improvement projects. And where you would expect to see that evidence would be in the management process, management review notes, um, discussions about projects, and inability to fund them because of the, the return on investment being you know, six months and the management wants three months. Um, th that's where you would expect to see the evidence. So again, 4.1 doesn't require documentation, but the external auditor wants to see where you have considered uh, some of these issues relative to your, your context and your, your management system. Okay, sites located in an ozone non-attainment area, the issues is that it would impact their air permitting requirements. The, the EMS process, we should see that is considered as in, in their compliance process and, and in operational controls. Uh, next site has got a corporate sustainability program. The issue is they have to report uh, monthly on their sustainability metrics, and we expect to see that evidence in their monitoring and measurement uh, process. So again, if we go back to the, the previous slide, it's taking these issues, looking at our specific location, understanding are there things that apply to us? Is our site a union site? We've got union labor. Issues might be uh, upcoming uh, contract negotiation and um, you know, employees are, are not interested or some other issue relative to the union contract. Um, but, but again, that's what the, what the external auditors are going to expect, is our ability to, to speak to some of these issues and then see some changes. If, again, if you've got an adjacent rail line, um, I worked with another organization that had a large ammonia system. That was part of their context internally. And, and they, they, they had a, a hazmat team uh, in equipment that would revel any fire department. And because the local the fire department didn't have a hazmat team, they would bring the, the fire department in to do joint training with them. Again, that's, that's part of their context. And they've, they've, they understand it. They've made adjustments in their environmental system, and that's where you're going to steer your, your external, external auditors. Okay, so is there any questions relative to, to your sites or maybe some specific contextual, contextual things that could apply to your locations? And now would be the time to chat in. I see we got Jonathan from uh, Woodward. Um, this is something that they need. Yeah, and this is, again, this is one of these, you know, when you look at what do we have to do to upgrade our system, um, this is one of these issues. And really the biggest issue from my perspective is to get management on board with what this means and be able to answer audit questions. And then secondly, um, you know, making a few of these small changes to your program or at least connecting the dots to what you're currently doing to, to the context of your environmental program. 
So I, I do see this as a, you know, a big change in words. You know, getting management to understand the, the intended outcomes, because what, the first thing your 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 uh, external auditor might ask your plant manager is, well, what are the intended outcomes of your environmental program? Well, and you know, most plant managers are politicians, and they'll, they'll talk long enough to to get to the right answer. Um, but but again, it's our ability to explain this to the management team, and and get them to understand, you know, these example examples of how you have considered your context in your environmental system. At this point, I'm assuming that this is as clear as water, and you guys all now have a newfound understanding of your context. Okay. Uh, the, the next uh, thing that I want us to, to look at here is understanding the needs and expectations of interested parties. You know, who, who is interested? Um, is it, I guess everyone's interested, maybe. Uh, but, but these would be parties that would be interested in our environmental management system. Um, understanding their needs and expectations, and then determining which of these turn into compliance obligations. So again, here, you, you don't see the word documentation. This does not require this specific element does not require documentation, but much like our context, once we've identified a group of interested parties, um, we should be able to demonstrate how these interested parties and their expectations are incorporated into our environmental management system. And then ultimately, which of these will become compliance obligations and these compliance obligations will be managed. I got to remember my my numbers now. Under 6.13 compliance obligations, which used to be called legal and other requirements. So, big picture, who are the interested parties? What do they need and expect from us? If there are compliance obligations from those needs and expectations, those get managed under 6.13 our compliance obligations process. Uh, th these are a few of the words from the standard, but the, the ones that, that I thought were interesting, this is sustained success is more likely to be achieved when an organization manages relationships to parties. So again, I, I, this is kind of where the ISO people are trying to nudge us. You know, we're gonna, <coughs> we're gonna be one with our community. We're going to manage relationships. We probably need some therapy to do that. But but again, just taking a much more proactive approach to uh, our environmental communications and our ability to to uh, achieve our intended outcomes. Would we need to publish our intended outcomes? No, no, you wouldn't. Um, this would be something where in your manual, you, you could talk to at least the three bullets, the three minimum issues relative to intended outcomes. Um, you, you need for your management team to be under, to understand that enhanced environmental performance, complying with our legal requirements, and achieving our objectives are the bare bones and in, uh, intended outcomes. Um, and again, you also may have some bigger picture uh, corporate sustainability programs. Um, that, that you may, may be striving towards. Uh, but again, don't need to document them, just need to understand them. So here's a pretty picture, because I'm, I'm a visual picture kind of guy, um, just to show some different examples of, of an interested parties. We've, we've got our employees, our, our, our company management, our owners, our customers, the, the community, uh, non-governmental organizations, maybe there's a, lo a local environmental group. Um, you know, Sierra Club's got a chapter in town and they're focused on you. Um, your supply chain, are, are they interested? Uh, your competitors, uh, would, would they be interested in, in how effective your program is because you're kicking their butt competitively? Um, so again, the first step here is 
understand who the interested parties are. Um, and again, calibrate your management team and make sure that they're, you know, understand, you know, how to answer these questions. And, and again, I think most site managers would, would probably do okay with this question. Um, maybe some of the other managers wouldn't. So uh, again, a nice pretty picture here uh, speaks a thousand words. Um, and, and again, there, there is no documentation required, but I'm suggesting to some of my customers that they might want to put together uh, some matrices or at least some descriptions of, of interested parties um, because, again, it reminds them constantly having this written out on their program uh, of who these interested parties are and, and how they're considered within the environmental management program. So obviously our owners and stockholders uh, are very interested in your environmental program. Uh, some of the you know needs and expectations, uh, uh, they, they need a sustainable business and a, a business continuity. They need to maximize shareholder value, their, their brand management, uh, compliance with legal, contractual, and customer requirements. And, and their particular co compliance obligation might be just maintaining certified management systems. A corporate could have specific EMS or regulatory programs. Maybe there's a corporate um, EMS manual. Maybe there's some corporate you know, hazardous waste, air quality, stormwater uh, programs that they expect you to comply with. Uh, your employees, again, they expect uh, some, some safe air quality, water quality, noise levels. Uh, their pride in the organization, um, and then linking those again to the compliance obligations. We should see uh, some understanding of our OSHA programs and the EPA Clean Water Act. Uh, unions, again, our union contract may have specific issues relative to, to our environmental program. Our customers have always been interested. They, they want us to be certified. Uh, they want us to provide them IMDS information on our products. Uh, they they may want us to be reach or recompliant if, if we're pushing products into the uh, in, in, into Europe. Uh, landlord, if we operating a lease facility, maybe we have a tenant lease agreement that requires us to keep everything inside and maintain their their no exposure sort of. Uh, uh, stormwater certification. Neighbors in the community, they obviously want us to control our discharges, be able to respond to spills and fires. Uh, the local utility companies, again, I think utility companies are a little strange in that, that they all want us to use less of their product. Um, and, and again, we should see some evidence of that in our, in our operational controls. Uh, local, state, federal uh, regulators, they, they've all given, uh, given us different types of regulations. Uh, local emergency responders, uh, the fire department, medical responders, they're, they're interested in um, you know, us communicating to them information about our facility and our chemicals and if they need to respond. So, so we should see evidence there under you know, the fire, local fire ordinance, uh, uh, the, our tier two reporting if that's required in our emergency response plans, contractors, suppliers, and consumers. So again, these are all people that would potentially be interested parties, and we should be able to speak to those during our, our registration audit to, with our registration company. Now, again, when, when we identify a compliance obligation, these are things that we will see managed under the requirements of 613. So this, this specific element doesn't require documentation, but 613 does. So there's where you'll see the CFRs, the ordinances, uh, contracts. Um, the, the one interested party that I didn't put on here that I've seen some companies mentioning is your registration company. Um, we have, you know, they are interested in your management system. You have a contract with them that requires certain things. Those are compliance obligations. And, and, and maybe one of the things that you could actually add to your compliance sheet 
to show your newfound um, awareness of your context. Because we're trying to give the registration auditors a few things to, to nibble on. Um, and, and if you identify their contract with you as a compliance obligation, that, that'll be something new to uh, demonstrate your, your understanding of your context. Okay, so, so here's what it, where, where it's all boiled down to. They want us to determine the scope of our management system, considering our context, our compliance obligations. Okay, so there may be things that are outside of our fence line that are now within the scope of our environmental system. There may be compliance obligations that we haven't identified before based on an interested party that we now include as part of our environmental management system. You know, a description of our of our organization function, physical boundaries, that's that's our fence line. Uh, the activities, products, and services that we provide. And E is the big one, our authority and ability to exercise control and influence. This is where our outsourced services and our supply chain management uh, comes into our scope now. Because when you, when you get into uh, 6.1, identification of aspects from a life cycle perspective, and 8.1, operational controls, uh, again, from a life cycle perspective, we have to demonstrate our controls for our outsource services. So we outsource plating. They're now that's now in our scope. We outsource painting. Now there are some limitations there, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but um, or scare you too much. But but those things that we can control or influence are in our control or influence is part of our scope. So when I choose to use Joe's plating versus a more expensive, reputable plating company, that choice is now in the scope of my environmental system. And I need to demonstrate how I made that choice. And did I actually consider uh, Joe's environmental footprint versus another company's? Those are things that we control and influence. Um, and, and there's a lot more to be had with that under section 8.1. Uh, and this element does require documentation. It says our scope has to be maintained as documented information and be available to interested parties. Um, it doesn't say we have to communicate it to interested parties. It says it has to be available. So what, what that tells me is that our scope communication can be much more passive. We can demonstrate that uh, if somebody were to call us up from the local fire department, the local branch of the Sierra Club, our, our, our union, if they wanted a, a description of our scope, we would provide it to them. Uh, the scope should not exclude significant aspects or compliance obligations, should not be misleading, and would suggest posting it in the plant next to your environmental policy. That's that's my suggestion. Um, I got into one audit one time where they actually had the plant split up. It, one part of the plant did aerospace work, the other part did automotive, and they only certified the automotive activities. That was a very strange audit. Um, I don't think that kind of stuff's going to fly anymore. It was, they were playing some kind of game. Um, I went to another location that treated and in in stored hazardous waste. But when they did their aspects analysis, the only significant aspect they identified was their potential to impact stormwater. And any other questions you ask them about other things, they say, well, that's that's not our significant aspect, so we're not that worried about it. Again, they were kind of playing some games. 
Um, I, I think this this new scope requirement uh, will stop organizations from being able to, to to play some of those games. But here's the first place today that we've seen something that must be documented. And the level of documentation, uh, again, it'll, it'll be up to you guys as an organization. Um, how do we document our scope? If we're a multi-site organization, um, I believe that you would be well served to have a scope description for each of the locations. And then collectively, all of those would, would serve as your scope description for the for the entire uh, group group certification. I'm working with one company that's got 25 sites certified under one certificate. But each location will will have its own scope description. Um, I think that's needed because of the contextual issues, and I think it's going to make it easier uh, for your external auditor to, to audit and, and understand. So as an example here, and again, I'm not going to paint this as the scope description. I like it because I came up with it. But, um, you know, again, just a description of what the environmental system addresses, you know, who we are, a little bit about our, our fence line and our property, a little description about our organization, what are the products that we produce, what, what are our basic processes, our customer-driven processes and our support processes. Uh, to, to address context and interested parties and, and life cycle perspective, I, I put some verbiage in there that we're, we're going to consider it, and, and you're going to see evidence of that inside of our environmental processes. Uh, the same with the life cycle perspective. That, that's the new you know, buzzword for considering how our activities affect the environment beyond our fence line. And, and those are covered in great detail under element uh, uh, 6.1. But but again, you know, I, I've seen uh, I've seen this done a couple, two or three different ways. Any way that you meet the requirements is uh, is sufficient. But again, go back to the words A through E, and you've got to, and, and it says here. The organization shall, it doesn't say your registration company shall or the auditor that showed up shall. It says you guys shall. You, you guys shall, A through E, define your, your scope considering A through E. And if you can clearly demonstrate to your auditor that you did this to meet A, you did this to meet B, you did this to meet C, D, and E, then, then you conform. Um, I, I see too many auditors out there writing up findings because of their their opinions. Auditors are not allowed to have opinions, but you, you can tell them how great their ideas are, how marvelous that might be to consider. If you want to consider that as an opportunity for us to improve, we'd love to. But this is how we met those words, and we conform. And I'm really you know, helping my clients to push back a lot harder on, on registration auditors that write findings that are merely based on their 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 opinions. John says, "Would you always include the life cycle in the scope?" <coughs> and again, you might look at the words. I don't see it in the element. Do I need to? Well, when I work with a company that gets their system put together and write documentation, I've got one goal, and that's to shut up their auditor. So to answer your, cover, your question specifically, <coughs> do I need to talk about life cycle in my scope? Probably not. Would I? Yes, because that's that's a big chunk of this whole new system. You know, when you get to six point you know one, dealing with risk and opportunities, aspects from a life cycle perspective, 
Um, I, I just think it, it, A, it doesn't hurt you, and, and B, it really sets the tone uh, with, your, with your registration people. And, and lastly, it starts to get your management team accustomed to saying those words. Uh, because it's easy for me and, and, the, and the environmental person to say the words and get it. Um, but over time, making sure that management uh, you know, people, quality managers, HR managers, warehouse managers, production managers, those types of people start to hear this word life cycle more and more and consistently. Um, I think putting it in your scope is a good place to uh, think about it. But is it required? I'm going to say eh, maybe not. Is it a good idea? I thought so. Um, but but again, in, in, in the words, too, I, I really haven't been very specific. And um, I have had a couple of sites with, with this type of a description audited, and there were no findings, so I, I guess it's okay. But really, it, it just points them under context, interested parties, life cycle. It just points them to our system. Hey, it's in there. We can answer the questions now because you've, you've, you've taken this great context training, and I, I know what my context is and the issues that I'm faced with, and I know where it's demonstrated inside the context of my environmental program. Um, that's the, the long and the short of that one. And, and then the last piece of the, this, this section of the element uh, of the standard, 4.1 or 4, environmental management system. Um, if, if you recall from the previous general requirements, 4.1, it just says we will maintain and improve a management system. Now, that's what 4.1 said. Uh, and this basically says the same thing. Um, but there might be some things, like I said, relative to our context and interested parties that we hadn't previously considered. So like some of these off-site emergency response issues, previously we may not have addressed those inside of our emergency action plan, but moving forward we should. Uh, doesn't have to be a lot of detail. You know, in the event of a train derailment, uh, we will we will evacuate the building. Um, employees will be directed to where to, you know, congregate upwind of the. It might be a very basic part of our uh, program, but it just shows that we've included it. So again, with 4.4, I don't see a, a lot of new things required. Uh, they, they've got this new word processes, for, you know, basically procedures. Um, you know, so look at your intended outcomes. <coughs> We're going to enhance environmental performance. We're going to comply with our legal stuff and we are going to achieve our environmental objectives. <clears throat> and additionally, we're going to enhance envir environmental performance. And here are the processes and procedures that we have to achieve those intended outcomes. Um, and, and if you can add a few, you know, one or two things relative to your, your newfound appreciation for your contacts and your newfound appreciation for interested parties, that would be good because then you can point to your ISO auditor and say, here's the one thing we changed based on looking at our context. He'll check his box. And this would be a very easy, uh, a very easy uh, requirement to meet and to, to comply with. Uh, so, so really from your ISO 14001-2004 system, your basic action items, you know, you need to define your context, who the interested parties are, what your intended outcomes are, and then you need to calibrate your management team. You need to explain those words, what they mean, how it applies to your organization, and really explain to them some of these new concepts. Uh, there's nothing really new to be documented um, but again, you might include just a description of how you do those things 
um, in the in the context of, of if you have a manual, if you have a procedure, you might just describe generally, you know, how you understood your context, generally who the interested parties are, uh, generally how to do that. Uh, you, need, you need to review and modify your description of your scope. Uh, again, take a look at your products, activities, and services. Uh, talk about the things that you can control and influence, suppliers and outsource services. <coughs> and then review the contacts and interests of parties to determine if there are any additional processes or changes to processes that need to be made in your environmental system. I'm used to talking a lot, but usually I get a break when somebody else talks back and my computer's not talking back to me. Um, so I'm getting very dry. But I think we're getting close here. So th those are the changes that you'll need to make to your 2004 program to upgrade to 2015. Okay. So again, I, I have developed the illustrious, what I'm calling plant manager series. I'm hoping to see some plant managers sign up. That'll be nice. Um, this particular um, webinar, I'm, I'm doing again on the 24th. So if you have any other people that are interested in this information or managers that you could force to sit through this uh, presentation, um, they can sign up on the 24th. Um, a number of you have already signed up for workshops as well. Um, one on management, leadership, and accountability. You know, how, how will managers be audited and, and how will they demonstrate accountability? Uh, one on environmental controls, outsource services, and then finally a management review and continual improvement. Uh, so I would encourage you to maybe share some of this information with your um, your, your, your other sites, your managers that might be interested. Um, this is who we are. I, again, I, I really appreciate those of you that are clients. Always appreciate your business. Um, always look for ways to help people streamline programs and, and be more prepared for programs. Um, we definitely would appreciate being uh, considered internal audits. We're, we're doing a lot of internal audits today. Uh, we've got a great two-day internal auditor program if you need to train a group of auditors. Um, but, but don't hesitate to give us a call um, with, with any of your needs. And, and that's how to get a hold of me. You probably know that already. Um, if, if you have any questions, you can let me know now or let me know via email. Uh, questions are always uh, free. I love, love to answer questions. Um, we do have... Another, a couple of paid workshops I'm doing, uh, about a two and a half hour webinar on life cycle, uh, identification of risk and opportunities from a life cycle perspective. Um, and then we've got a full five hour uh, webinar on the complete transition process, uh, where we include a lot of different templates and handouts uh, to help people update their programs as well. So if, if you guys are interested in that, um, I will, it, it is posted on my website and I will continue, and I don't want to take it to a spam level, but I will moderate my uh, email communication so that you'll be receptive to those. But um, yeah, I, I hope that, again, this, this brief uh, webinar has, has helped you guys kind of clarify what, what they mean by context. Um, how you're going to demonstrate conformance in your management system, and then some of the evidence that your registration auditors might be looking for um, when they come out to do your, your upgrade audit to the uh, 2015 standard. So if you have any questions, let me know via your, your, your chat box. If, if not, you can, you can call me tomorrow because 5 o'clock, I'm done, right, Union? Um, and Or email. And uh, just just want to help you guys uh, uh, be prepared for your upgrade audits and help in any way that we can. And that's it.